so before we really, we really get started, why don't we just go ahead and give us a bit of an introduction, who you are, a bit of your history, and then you, what, 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 the, what you're working on right now. I'll go first. I'll yeah. go first. So my name is Chen Pen. I'm um, from Binance.com. So Binance.com is a crypto-to-crypto -crypto exchange. Um, let me see how many people know Binance.com. Okay. Uh, okay, that's pretty good. Um, so we do crypto-to-crypto -crypto, uh, exchange, and uh, we don't touch fiat. We started six months ago, and I think a couple of days ago we were ranked number four uh, on coin market cap around the world in terms of trading volume. So that's pretty much what we do. Hi, hi, everybody. So my name is Antti. I'm I'm a founder of uh, also founder of company called Yolla, which was established 2011. It continued Nokia's me operating system develop, development, and we continued that project and uh, uh, developed Selfish OS mo mobile operating system, which is one of the probably five operating systems in the world uh, as a startup project. And um, one and a half years ago, we started looking into blockchain, so that what can we do in blockchain and mobile if we combine our know-how in uh, mobile and blockchain, what comes out of that. And uh, at the moment we are uh, uh, designing uh, and making a blockchain phone platform so that it would become easy to use uh, for all cryptocurrency people to use uh, smartphones so that your private keys are easy to handle and safe. And then secondly, what we want to build is, is an application platform for all the blockchain application developers so that we can build a beautiful, easy to use user experience for the, uh, uh, everybody, from ma to masses to grandmas and every everybody, basically. That's, that's what we do. Great. Hello, um, my name is Kevin Serrano. I am a full stack developer for the project called MetaMask. And for those of you who don't know, um, MetaMask is a browser extension that allows you to access decentralized applications using your normal browser um, on the Ethereum ecosystem. I've been on this project for about a year and a half now. And what we're very concerned about is um, user security and user accessibility. We believe that one of the biggest hurdles to adoption is um, the barriers to entry and um, user friendliness. And so we are trying to tackle that as best we can. Um, right now, although we are a browser extension, we're just about to move on to applications that will allow us to move on to mobile, um, mobile phones as well. Um, so yeah, that's what we're working on. Great, awesome, awesome. thanks guys. So, um, so you, you know, as, as you guys have you know, probably been following yourself, there's a lot of hype about ICOs, initial, initial coin offerings, you know. Um, there's, there's, you know, 50 in the last month, you know, which is more than there were in all of, all of 2016. I think the, the last number that I remember is like 2.3 billion US dollars has been raised through initial coin offerings. But, um, but I want to take a step back. So, so what, what, is an, what is an ICO? Uh, what, is, what, what, is it, what does it entail? What, what, is the, what does that process look like? You know, take a stab at it. Sure, we actually offer an ICO platform. So for anybody who wants to do an ICO, Binance Launchpad, we will launch again um, at the end of this month. So ICO, my understanding is very simple. If you want to do a project or if you want to do anything, you say, hey, I'm doing this project and uh, whoever wants to help me out can give me coins and I'll give you my coin re in return. And my coin has certain benefits and um, if you think, if you believe that I will fulfill those benefits, then you can invest. It's a purely voluntary action. So if you give me your coin, I'll give you my coin, uh, or you, typically you give me Bitcoin or Ethereum, or in our case, uh, Binance coin, and the new project will issue uh, their coin. And if their project do, do well, and they fulfill their promises, and their pr uh, coin become valuable, so then it's a good investment on return. Uh, yeah, good return on investment. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it's a very high risk situation. It's the same as any startup. Um, quite a large number of them do fail, will fail. So it's a risky type of invi investment. So that's, you know, very basic fundamentals. That's what my understanding of ICOs are. And uh, we see a lot of them right now. Right, right. And so, so Zipper, do you guys deal with, with ICOs at all? Yeah, so we've been studying this area for uh, closely more than a year or now, and I've been trying to find out that how, how can one approach it with a 
in a legal way and in a, in a kind of a logical way. And uh, I think token sales uh, in general are great. Uh, like uh, many uh, companies like Linux uh, would have had a token as a community project. It would have been great. Everybody understands that. But uh, I think the fundamental thing about ICOs is that uh, it does make sense if the token has uh, token economics, so that there's real demand and use for the token, and you can really see that the company who's establishing it could have a chance to scale that into currency effect volume, basically. And uh, I think, I would say that ICO 2017 is very different term than ICO 2018. Mm. I, ICO 2017 was unregulated, very wild, uh, thousands of projects, uh, very few of them actually had token economics. Now, 2018 will be smart projects. Uh, there will be um, doodle against done on, on those. People will not accept anything uh, and, and so on. And then regulators will come in as well, and which is good. I, I think it's good that regulators will come to regulate these ideas. Yeah, I mean, because it is, as, as you were saying, it's, um, it's almost an illegitimate way of, of raising funds in, yes. in, in, a certain, in a certain way. So rather than going through venture capital, um, instead raising, raising money through the sale, the sale of tokens. Um, but before we get into the topic, um, so, so Kevin, so what, what, what exactly are tokens, and, and, and how, are they, how are they being used on these, these blockchain projects? Um, if we're specifically talking about, if we want to get very technical, there's a very specific definition of what a token is, at least on Ethereum. There's a standard called the ERC-20 that defines certain properties that a token can have. But then on top of that, you can build all sorts of functionality for a token. And frankly, that's sort of the uncertainty that revolves around these token sales and token launches is that every single token has its own different purpose. And so there is no real sort of stable sort of knowledge of knowing what exactly a token will do, nor will it sort of like how its value will hold or sort of like how its distribution, it's just, it's very wild west at this point. And so MetaMask has been very, um, we've been on the front lines sort of as a, a technology medium for people to participate in these token sales. And we've seen that there's so many ways to participate in what could be a token and how a token is like distributed that it's, it's very hard to answer that question, really. It's, <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's just, it seems to change every day. Right. And so I find it hard to give a clear answer to that. But in general, a token basically gives you, um, usually, and there are always exceptions, um, some sort of, um, of value to like um, use the platform, basically. Okay. So you have some certain right to use the platform in generally an expendable way. Of course, again, there's like some, some sales that have tokens that generate other tokens, which are then used as the currency to power the platform. Yeah, so it's not very easy to like pin down that definition in my opinion. Right, right, but, 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 but fundamentally, they're just, they're just things that can be traded between, between users. I mean, that, that is a property of them, I would assume. But I, I, I would hope that's not sort of the primary sort of way that we perceive them. I, could, I would add something to that, it's, it's, otherwise it would be just currency and it wouldn't right. make just only sense, but I, I think all the tokens are actually also commu community projects. So you can see Bitcoin people are very passionate on that, they buy those tokens because they believe in those. The Ethereum people are also very passionate, there's a community behind and that's an essential part of the token. It's not the technology itself. I could establish a Rhino token if I, I would join forces with all the people who want to save Rhinos in the world, and that would be a viable token model. Mm. Mm. So I guess I mean so one of the one of the big questions that I have um, is do we like for blockchain applications do we need tokens? Like are are tokens a necessary part of a blockchain application? Um, I think basically tokens are not necessary, but uh, it's a very convenient way for people to create a token and then distribute that on the blockchain. So it, token, in my view, is basically any asset that's on the blockchain that you can, and ERC-20 is a standard that people use very commonly because that's easy to use. So anyone can create their token very easily. Um, and it's a blockchain asset, so nobody can fake it. Nobody can, can create uh, counterfeits. Uh, counter so um, that's basically what 
uh, tokens are. And it's very useful right now because for any project who wants to raise money, who wants to uh, issue their own token, they can do it. And whoever wants to invest can invest. Nobody is forcing anybody to invest. So um, people are doing, that's why ICOs are really popular now. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Kevin, sorry, can you just repeat the question so I can like read? So, so the, question, the question was about, um, about tokens. Are, are they necessary for, for blockchain applications? I think I would concur that they're not necessary, but they are definitely a very helpful part of the ecosystem. Um, for, um, not, it's not all for good. There are obviously a lot of downsides to adopting the token model. And I think that not every project needs to adopt a token model, um, but I think sort of this explosive growth that we've been seeing in tokens, um, it, will, it will actually help us answer that question really. Like, will it become an unnecessary part of the ecosystem? Will it become normalized? Yeah. Um, and I think there have been a lot of voices in the industry that have been saying um, the way that we see sort of these, these token sales happening, um, the way that we, we um, act on them will be very different in, uh, I think, a few years into the future. Right now, I think we're sort of figuring out how the best way to sort of set up these token sales are. We have the base technology, but sort of like building how we like further structure that is something we're continuing to polish. Yeah. I'd li like to still answer also that there, there's always, a, very, very often there's a question that wh wh why do you need an own token? Why can't you use, for example, Ethereum ETH to token? But, but uh, I think, first of all, uh, it's not easy for startups to succeed without being able to incentivize their own ecosystem and community. Mm. And the own token brings the, those tools to the startup. So those are really needed. For in this smartphone project, we are competing with Android and uh, very big companies. Um, if I can't incentivize my developers and fans to, to join forces with me, I don't have anything to compete with. So that, that's why tokens are important. And secondly, I think having an own token gives you some sort of uh, technological flexibility as well. Mm. We all know that, for example, Ethereum has uh, own issues in terms of scalability. There's uncertainties also over there. So you want to have cer certain kind of a flexibility having your own token as well to to see what kind of a platform you will be building that in the future as well. Yeah, that's interesting. And so, so it's almost, I mean, tokens are almost um, a, a, a separate asset class from, from equities yeah. in that sense, where yeah. people, uh, people can buy into it and, not, and they don't necessarily have a say in how, the, how, how the, the company or the product is developed, but they have an investment in seeing it succeed. So I guess, I mean, so one of the, one of the big, big questions that, that I really have about ICOs and, and, and a lot of these... Um, uh, token offerings is you know you look at you look at Bitcoin and and, and Bitcoin never had an ICO. Bitcoin it's it's all been generated through uh, you know these these massive uh, mining rigs um, you know solving the very complex uh, cryptographical problems and then once that problem is solved then then a new a new Bitcoin is created. But you see with the ICOs it's like these 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 companies are just you know making making these coins kind of kind of out of out of thin air. And so I'm curious. I mean like. So is, is, is there a place for mining in, in ICOs? And, and why, aren't, why are companies just creating coins out of nothing? Um, I think mining works for Bitcoin because it's an ecosystem that slowly evolved. Uh, mining does not work for a lot of new projects unless you're developing new blockchain. Uh, for example, even for Binance, we, when we released our coin, our coin is a utility coin on our platform and our affiliated platforms. Um, but we're not doing the mining, we're not doing anything mining. So we're not really creating a new blockchain. We just want a token that we can use. So uh, for different type of projects, a token doesn't have to be mined. Uh, mining was just one way of, uh, mining, mining was Bitcoin's way of doing consensus. And there's many other ways of doing distributed consensus since then. So um, I think mining still has its place, uh, but I think going forward, you will see a lot more tokens without mining. Uh, because now there's the, I believe the technology, the blockchain technology without mining is mature enough. So, so what, but what, is that, what does that mean? So, so you're creating a token, but you're not creating a new blockchain. What, is, what does that mean? Uh, so basically for us, for example, we, at the moment, we are not creating a new blockchain. Uh, we're using the Ethereum blockchain, but we have, a to we have issued a token that has uh, uh, value and properties associated with our platform. And we have promises on what the values uh, we deliver. So uh, in that sense, the token is really like a, uh, traditionally it might, it might be similar to a piece of paper where it's a stock certificate, but for us it's, it's a token that we cannot fake. Mm. So uh, everybody can verify it. 
and that service that serves enough enough purpose for most projects uh, that doesn't want to develop a new blockchain. Yeah. So I think basically any project. Well, let me expand this a little bit. Um, I think any country, any province, any project, any company, any person, anything can issue a token. You can tokenize everything, and once you tokenize it, you can trade it. And you do, this chair, we may have a chair token that organizes uh, values or chairs in this room. And that's tradable on exchange, and that has value. But it doesn't need to be mined, mm. right? So there's no mining for that token. Yeah. Yeah. You guys want to weigh in on that? So, so mining versus yeah. thin air? Yeah, so uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of thin air <laughs> in, in that sense. But I, I also understand that mi mining, in in sense, it describes that there's effort done for the to, to give birth to the token. But of course, this effort can be done in different ways. That, for example, it could be done in that way that a uh, developer team establishing or bringing a new application on a mobile platform, for example, gets tokens against their effort. That's kind of a mining, but it's very different kind of mining. So, and there's a news portal or blog portal called Steam, uh, or Steamit. Uh, the, the, the effort is that you are writing blocks, you are, you are kind of uh, advertising blocks and so on. So there's effort behind the token. So I, I think that's a viable model. Not all the tokens have to be kind of uh, have immediate value, but it has to have a kind of long-term e ecosystem value right. that there is some effort behind there. Right. And, and a lot of it, a lot of the mining, I mean, a lot of that is, is because uh, Bitcoin in particular is based on a proof of work um, consensus yeah. model. Um, but, but, you know, Ethereum, the Ethereum project and other blockchains are, are trying to f figure out how to do uh, a secure proof of stake. Yeah. And so, so Kevin, can you, can, can, you, can you just describe a little bit of that difference maybe? Um, yeah, so proof of work is, um, how should I describe it in a way that makes sort of sense? It's just basically slap a lot of CPU power onto um, your blockchain, and then more like, the more likely you are to sort of get the, to get the token, get the coin, um, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum. So without going into too many high level, de uh, too many technical details, just think of proof of work as something that's very CPU intensive. Whereas um, proof of stake is just like as the name implies, you put in a sort of stake into, um, into becoming a part of sort of the consensus algorithm. And then once you sort of, um, you, you are allowed to then sort of determine what blocks are valid and what blocks are invalid, and you will be rewarded or punished based on how you sort of like vote on the block. And so, like again, not going into too many details, um, this model um, relies a lot on having the most CPU power and sort of equalizes the playing field for people to like participate in the consensus algorithm. Um, and just to sort of address your, your other points about um, mining. So the primary reason why we do mining in the first place is to achieve the cryptographic security that Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these other cryptocurrencies um, guarantee um, without having like the centralized service, right? And so, while it is true that you could ha have a token that could be a, a new coin, cryptocurrency that could be mined, um, with Ethereum having this new sort of ERC20 layer on top of it, um, there's a lot of incentive to just like use that model already. So build on top of Ethereum because there are miners already working on it. People, um, miners will process your token transactions and you don't have to set up and incentivize m miners to first set up an infrastructure and then get people to actually buy into the token itself. So, so, so Ethereum is a mined currency as well? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So there you go, learn, learn, learn something new every day. So, so um, I'm curious, and so looking, looking at uh, the projects that, that you guys are working on specifically, what, what role does, does, the, does the token play? Um, and um, like how, how, how are they used? How do you pull people into your ecosystem? So for us, the token's role initially was to do the fundraising. So people invest in the token, um, and then we distribute the token. We use the Ethereum ERC20 token, which is a very standard basic token. Um, and it has associated benefits to our platform. People get this, it's a utility. You can use that to pay for fees, get a 50% discount on our platform. You can invite other users to join our trading platform and they get 50% of the fees they pay. 
Um, so it's a token that's utility driven. And later on, we're going to convert that into, we will develop our own blockchain, which is a decentralized exchange. And we will convert the Binance uh, coin ERC20s into that native token. And that will continue to be a gas on that platform. So I think tokens are very useful for us. Uh, it's a very, uh, we would not be where we are um, if, was, if it was not for the ICO token, if we, had, if we didn't have this token uh, method available for us to do fundraising, I think it would take us six years to arrive at where we are six months later. So for us, it's a great benefit. Yeah. So, it's, so basically, like, be, being, being able to, to have this ICO and then have a token, tokenized platform, you're able to build out your company a lot faster. Much, much faster. Um, I think it's not the, I think there's a lot of risks in the ICO, but not only the token, during the ICU process, we already gathered our loyal users, loyal fans, so they actually joined our platform way before we started. And then when we launched, we had the initial seed users, seed funds, everything was ready to go. And that's something that a traditional fundraising uh, method cannot achieve. Yeah. So that's hugely beneficial for a platform like us. So I, I, I give you an example. When, when we started YOLA in 2011, uh, we had like... Uh, I think about 10,000 people as a very active community, community who believed on us. And, and then we had uh, application developers who started developing apps on our platform, but we had no tools to incentivize and reward both this community or application de developers. So what, what the token for us now is, is it's a reward token so that we can reward our developers on, on uh, developing applications on that and reward the early users contributing to uh, getting new customers on that. And we are building this in a, in a way that applications, the application ecosystem actually is, is buying those tokens and rewarding because they have the incentive. And then uh, we're also building a curation market for the App Store so that uh, people can actually bet on the, what are the future uh, most successful applications. So if you become successful on, on your betting activity, you will earn, earn tokens. For example, if you could have bet on WeChat years ago, you would be a millionaire probably by now in this model. Interesting. So I'm curious, and so you said that you, you're, you um, reward early adopters and developers with this token, but then how do they use the token? So they, 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 use, they would, for example, use this in a creation ma okay. market. So that, that's one use case that they can bet on, on different right, applications. Right, right. And, okay. and that actually can be a very, very interesting model in, in all, all ways. And a very good example why tokens are very interesting, uh, kind of the financial tools also. Yeah, yeah cool. So, so Kevin, does, does MetaMask use tokens at all? No. So, <laughs> yes. so, so, how do you, so, so how do you guys interact with tokens then? Because, because like your project really is kind of making um, Ethereum-based applications more, more user-friendly. So, so what role does tokens play in, in, your, in your application? So there are several ways to participate in a token sale. Like several, several ways. Um, if any of you have read like Vitalik Buterin's sort of article on how we can build a better, um, IC, better token sale, um, you can see there's just like, there's so many ways to do them. And one of the ways that in order to participate in a token sale is to actually visit a website that has um, a connection to the Ethereum blockchain and directly participate in the token sale from there. And one way that we enable that is by using um, MetaMask. MetaMask allows you to participate in certain types of token sales. So we've been, although we do not have a token, a MetaMask token, we have been able to sort of see firsthand the kinds of users that are participating in these other different token sales through us. And keep in mind, we don't, we don't get a, a cut of the share of these ICOs that are using us. We are a public, free, open source product that anyone can use. And so for us, tokens represent a, an interesting yeah, vote of confidence in the product. Um, one that is very in its infancy stages and has a lot of legal and technical complications, but I think it, um, above, it is a continuation of the lowering of the barrier of entry for people to participate in these technology projects. Um, of course, the, the legality of that is still to be discussed in each country and jurisdiction, but in general, um, it has allowed people who don't normally participate in the blockchain ecosystem to now just start investing to start being a part of this active system. And that is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, a good thing in that like, it's lowering the barriers of entry, but by lowering the barriers of entry, you're also 
including these low information investors that may not necessarily know a lot about the projects that they're investing in and maybe buying into, say, hype. And so, yeah, it's a very complicated sort of buy-in, but we've been very interested to see sort of um, how these token sales have, have been evolving. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you, the thing is with ICOs, as, as someone, I, I, don't, I don't own any Bitcoin, I don't, I don't own any Ethereum or any other, um, any other uh, tokens or coins. So, so from the outside, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to kind of tell which ICOs are legitimate, like which are legitimate projects and which are just, you know, people trying to see what they can get away with. So, so for, for you guys, what are some good, good projects, some good ICOs that you've seen, obviously other than, than yours, uh, but, but, but like what are, what, are some, what are some good examples of projects that have used ICOs recently? All right, so there's some very famous projects. Ethereum did an ICO, very successful project. I think the early investors probably got a few thousand X on their investment. And um, it's, a, it's building an ecosystem around it now, so it's a very solid project. Um, some of the bigger coins, like NEO is a pretty strong one that's born in China. Um, and um, so I think I wouldn't comment, because I'm an exchange operator, so I generally don't comment on which coins are really good because then that kind of causes potential speculation and everything else. So I'll let this gentleman <laughs> comment on that. Yeah, I, I would a little bit take same same view. I would take a kind of a wait and see for, first because there are huge promises and I would like to see those promises fulfilling. I, I think currently Ethereum is the only uh, platform which has made a, I can say that they have made a good job on, on their ICO and uh, work. Uh, however, even, in, even there it seems to be that uh, they have to solve the scalability uh, issue uh, because now there are more than 1,000 projects relying on them being able to scale mm -hmm. and the current scale is about one uh, Saturday IKEA transaction size so there's a long way to go for those promises. Yeah, yeah. So, like, like these two, I can't really comment on any specific sales. Come on. I'm sorry, I know you want it, but unfortunately, no. Uh, but I will comment on sort of, yes, how, how we're sort of determining what is, the good, what is the good token sale and what is the bad token sale. Um, I can name a few red flags. So, the biggest red flag, I think, is to really examine how the token sale is doing its distribution, how the actual sale is happening. Um, it's very suspicious if there's an uncapped sale um, without sort of another um, me mechanic to sort of help like stabilize the price. Um, it's, it's also suspicious if um, you read the white paper and every ICO has a, every token sale has a white paper, right? Um, it's impossible for it not to have one, but not all white papers are created equally. And so by exam, it's, although it's a time consuming effort to read a white paper, if people are very serious about investing in the technology, they should read what the technological basis of that paper is. Um, because if, if, the, if the paper just reads more like an advertisement rather than something that actually has technological backing, then it, that's a huge red flag. Um, I think a really good green flag, though not like a, a sign of approval, but a, a good sign is if the token sale um, basically has models such as um, a cap limit and models such as uh, guaranteeing that uh, users can rely on a stabilized price of the, the token. Uh, again, if you read sort of Vitalik Buterin's um, post on uh, good, good token sales going forward, um, it'll have a lot of insights. Anything that takes insight from that is, is, is a good sign. Um, but I think we're still continuing to learn how, um, how these, uh, what, what determines what is a good token sale and a bad token sale because the volume of which the, the, the market is sort of being flooded by these is, 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 is mind boggling. And it's impossible for any one user to just say, hey, um, to go through all 80 of those right. and like, be, like thoroughly investigate each. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, so maybe you guys can't comment on any specific ones, but like if we look at all the token sales so far from this year, what percentage would you say have been good ICOs or, or legitimate ICOs? If we can put a number on it. Um, I think in 2017, I would say <clears throat> probably around 10 to 20% are good ICOs. So that leaves 80 to 90% and probably well. As any, invest, as any startup project probably will fail. 
Um, back right. in two thousand. So, so, so yeah. in terms, of, so like, so like in terms of like a like a, a bad ICO, it's not it's not that they're Ill, like it's it's an illegitimate project. It's more that mm. that the startup may not just may not really take off. Right. Okay. So I think there's two two ways they can fail. They can just be a scam, which is bad, and they can be a group of guys who really want to make it work but couldn't make it work for whatever reason. Uh, startups fail fail all the time. Um, I think basically continue on that point on select. I think 2006, you, you, there was much less ICOs, and those most of those those ICOs are done by the core sort of guys who are very core into the blockchain industry, and there was a much higher success rate in 2015 as well. Very few projects, um, and Ethereum was kind of in the 2014, uh, 2000, I actually forgot 2000, end of 2014, December 2014 range. So those back in the day, there was like early projects that's very few, but um, because of those were very successful. People are now crazy about it. Uh, but I think basically echoing what Kevin said is, you want to do your own research. Um, I believe from an exchange operator perspective, we see all kind of investors. Uh, we see guys who just want to buy ICOs. We see guys who are doing fundamental analysis. We, we see guys who just trade on rumors and news. Everybody have a different way of trading. Everybody have a different way of investing. I think you can use your own way, but always do your homework. And over time, you want to perfect your own way. Right. Um, and when, you, when your own way is not perfected, if you're new to investing, if you're new to ICOs, don't invest more than what you can lose. Yeah. Right? So if you're investing in ICO, uh, if you, this is the first ICO you're investing in, invest one-tenth of what you really want to invest in. Right? Invest just a little bit. Uh, uh, test it out. And never be in a hurry to say, oh, if I miss this opportunity, then I'm going to miss everything. Right. There's always more opportunities in the future than there was in the past. Sure. So there's way more ICOs that will come. Uh, there's way more investment opportunities later. So always do your homework. So, so yeah, Antti, so same, same question to you. Can we give yeah, a number on I, this? I would give two answers. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, I think we need to understand that uh, the success rate, long-term success rate of these ICOs anyways will be low. So it's, if it's in startup sector, around 10%, uh, this could be the three to, two to three percent could be the realistic so because it really takes a lot to create the currency it it, it really takes a lot mm. but, but that's fine because those two to three percent could provide huge uh, uh, kind of a return for the investment so if you invest into 100 you could get still very good return uh, because there is no proper due diligence at the moment so anybody can just make a white paper and advertise an ICO I think uh, probably about 30% uh, of all 2017 ICOs would be good, okay. kind of a properly planned. And there must be a huge amount of kind of uh, trash. Right, yeah. right. So, so Kevin, where do, you, where do you stand? So John Pung says uh, 10 to 20, Auntie says about 30. Where, where do you stand on this? Uh, no comment. Uh, though I will <laughs> say, I will say 2017 was the year of Wild West fundraising, I believe in this ecosystem. And next year, we will definitely see a lot of regulations come into play. And also, we will, we'll, we'll, next year, we'll be able to answer a question. A year from now, we can see which, which um, sales have, which pro projects have basically failed in that time period, and which ones have really stood the test of time. And so, since this is all sort of like, this is the first year that we've seen this explosive growth. Um, at the beginning of February this year, 12 out of the top 100 crypto assets were um, built on the Ethereum ecosystem. Now it's 90 out of 100 um, as of a few days ago. And so um, for us to like, make that evaluation, I think is, um, it's a little premature. I mean, we can say yes, 90% uh, of startups fail, correct? Um, but I think perhaps today, um, this time will be different. And right. we'll see what the number, how the numbers fall by next year. Well, great. Well, great. Um, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for, for sharing your experience and telling us more about tokens, ICOs, and, and what you guys are working on. Let's, let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you.